they're just doing a little cut and that's it. Or, or I may even hear the mix and or the master and be like, I don't hear an actual. I don't Much know if I hear a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Which yeah. kind of means you. That means, that means that means you're getting better at mixing, also, right? Like it means yeah, that yeah. your your mixes are are definitely getting better. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Um, what, what was I going to say on that note? Is is are you printing with your limiters on? Are you you keep you take them off before you send them out? What 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 does that look like? Sometimes I do. Um, sometimes I so like if I have a Pro L two, like whatever extra gain is going into, like just bring it back a little bit. But I still have it go through it because I guess the algorithm is still part of the sound. Just because it's not, right, yeah, it's not gain. You know, doing gain reduction doesn't mean it's not coloring the sound. So mm. I'll just bring it down a little bit, and then sometimes it'll just be on there. And I'm like, this. If I take this off, then the drum and the bass and things are gonna hit different. So it's like, yeah, sure. But I'm I'm always I'm always looking at the lofts. Like I'm not I'm never sending them like you know ridiculous lofts. You know, there's lofts that are still there. There's still headroom, but right. It's about like yeah, the limiter is 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 basically about like how hard you're hitting into it and are you using it for gain reduction as far as like making the track louder to send to the client, and then also like when you're thinking about removing those things, you're kind of like taking away some of the sound. Yeah, yeah. I know some people are scared because they're like, oh, there's no there's no room. I'm like, they work with a lot less room than you think. Like, <laughs> I see some mass engineers yeah. work with like four lofts or whatever like they'll work with Fuck. it they'll hate you but they'll work with it <laughs> right 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 yeah i mean i've been finding like the kind of the balance of like sending a version that has the limiter on it and one that doesn't so they can hear at least what is what, what how it sounds once it's hitting it so they can kind of do it maybe better than me but like you know but have an idea of how the the kick and bass and you know the big transients are hitting that limiter so to speak yeah i just i just send what the client approved really and just like okay the yeah. client approved it because yeah. I had sometimes where mastering the client would be like I don't like this and I'm like right. really, I'm like you, you could tell them to do a flat transfer and they could do that if you if you want that you know sometimes mm-hmm. uh, they, they may make a change um, there may be enough space where they might do like a, a, a shelf somewhere and all of a sudden mm-hmm. it shifts the low end energy or it shifts where the top end is and all of a sudden start, things mm-hmm. start coming in and out of balance because when you're doing with like mastering and they have those wide cues and they have the ability to kind of go into the record, they can internally change the balance of a record just yeah. with the frequencies alone. So all of a sudden you feel like your hi-hats are louder and your vocals like yeah. sizzling because all they did was add some shelving, but that shelving went below 12K and it's affecting everything below that. So it's like affecting your... Your right. upper, your upper mid range and like top end balance. So it's like they're 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 um, they do a lot, and you know they they just QC the record basically. Yeah, they could do they could do a lot to improve and a lot uh, surprisingly a lot to improve and 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 fuck up the record basically. And sometimes when they improve it, you're like, wow, that it sounds like doesn't even sound like the same mix. You know, they might mm. open things up and all of a sudden your the ambience that you are working with the verbs got more apparent in a, in a nice way, not in like mm-hmm. a bad way, but, um, yeah, yeah but you know, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's about sending, like, I guess for me, it's sending what the client approved on. And that someone yeah. was uh, a bunch of people, uh, well, I think it was Nicholas DiLorenzo told me about that, that Serban's guy, uh, I think his name is John something, uh, was on like gear space talking about what they do. And he basically said like, yeah, we send whatever the client approved is what we send to mastering, which is yeah the limited version. You yeah, know? yeah, the loud version. <laughs> people, yeah, so, people do that. So that that uh, seems to be the the mo in, in LA. At least in LA these days, it seems to be what's happening. I don't know if in Nashville there's maybe people getting a bit more headroom. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I mean, uh, I think with the pop records, the way the way that they're hitting and things like that, like you just want it to stay right. like that. No matter what, yeah. I mean, I was doing that before I mean, when I was in New yeah. York, but um, it's it's just it's just really the quality ensure the record. You're kind of like you're kind of like putting the the record with the bow on, you know, not expecting someone else to put the bow on. You're like, because they don't want surprises, yeah. you know. When when you come back from mastering, you don't want a surprise, and they're mm-hmm. like, the record's out, and you're like, holy shit, this is not what I expected. Man, it's it's like it's like covering your your it's like covering your covering your uh, your rear end or whatever. It's uh, try to think of a better expression than that. 
Yeah, it's like, yeah. yeah cover, it's co- covering your ass. You're basically covering your ass, and like this is my mix. You know, basically. And it's not even an ego thing. It's just like it's just like a quality insurance thing. Because I don't think it was like, yeah. oh, it doesn't need mastering. I'm like, it definitely needs mastering because someone needs to listen to it and quality control it. Like and that's that's where I see exactly. It as. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're listening to it. They 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 listen to way more records than I'm listening to in a day. Right. And they have right. a really tuned room, and they're like, hey, you know, like when I go to mastering sessions, like the the changes that they're doing are so small. And it's like A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B. And it's like, you know, I went to like Sterling Sound and, and had stuff mastered. And like the changes are so small. But I'm like, that's good. Because I was like, I I, I want to know if I'm getting better and if I'm working on, you know. Yeah, totally. I love that, man. That's a great that's a great approach. Um, oh, I, the, the other thing I, I wanted to, to talk to you about was um, you, uh, I, I saw that you've been get, doing a bunch of like presets for companies, Baby Audio. Yeah, Baby Audio. Tell me a little yeah. bit about, tell me a bit about how that came together and how you got, kind of got asked to do it and what that was like. It was great, man. Baby Audio, Casper at, at, at Baby Audio and um, Keeve Audio, uh, Eddie over there. Uh, yeah, they just asked if, you know, I wanted to do some presets. Um, I kind of sent over my CV and discography. Baby Audio started started first. I think the first presets I did was like Smooth Operator, which is like their sued. So I've been using, I, I use that a lot um, for vocals. I have like a vocal smooth preset, which I made for myself. So <laughs> I use it a lot. Um, it nice. kind of takes around, you know, takes out some of the 200, 300. And it has like a sharper cue going into like the harsh sibilance range, 2 to 5K. Mm. So I kind of shift that yeah, around, yeah. and I did presets for their tape machine plugin, and kind of stuck yeah, in great some, things about it. Some fragrance uh, uh, preset names for it. Um, I have <laughs> I have this uh, lo-fi piano sound, which is like basically like wow and flutter, just going crazy. So it sounds like a detuned like lo-fi piano sound. It's pretty crazy. Um, mm-hmm. And they just came out with a reverb called Chris- Crystalline, which I made some presets for. I made like a lexicon kind of preset, this kind of verby room preset, which is like a, it kind of sounds like a spring reverb. Like imagine a spring reverb being mm-hmm. like a medium room kind of sound. Um, oh, cool. And like a vocal plate sound for it so yeah they're they're awesome so that's just like fun extras of of being in the business and getting to do cool things like that yeah yeah it's cool and you know the, uh, i'm happy companies like that are supporting uh new engineers you know new mixers because when i was growing up there's only like you know waves coa and maserati and those guys you, you yeah you, yeah they're just kind of the older generation of engineers and not the, the newer guys so right like, bb audio has a bunch of my buddies on there you know Jesse Ray has his plugins. Like it's just sure. cool to just yeah, and he does his plugins with Keeve, right? Am I right? Y- yeah, he does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been using his plugins a lot too. It's Tilt and Rubber Band. Yeah, Tilt is is sweet. The Rubber Band is awesome. Yeah, yeah. He he did some cool stuff. I, th- I know he's doing more. So it's cool to see also like younger mixers kind of getting into the plugin game and kind of trying to like get a little bit of uh, something happening there. And. uh yeah, I thought even Bobby Osinski mentioned uh, one of Jesse Ray's plugins. I don't remember which one. I think it was, I think it was um, the Rubber Man compressor. And he's like, you know, do you know Bobby Osinski? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He's uh, you know he's he's one of the bigger educators, right? You know. Yeah, he's like the OG of the audio education world, and he's got like books and. Yeah, he's you know, he's, he's the goat. Bu- he's got every. He's got read yeah, all exactly. Books. I was like, oh, he's talking about Jesse Ray Jesse Ray Ernster's plugins. Cool. <laughs> all right, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His, uh, his. I I love his podcast for like I, I don't listen to it all the time, but but his openings are 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 just amazing because he's just like is so on the pulse of what's happening in the industry, and he'll just kind of like give an update every single episode of like this is what's happening now with you know such and such, and he'll do like his like yearly kind of like predictions of like okay i predicted that spotify is gonna like you know go the ipo is gonna go down or whatever he'll like make a bunch of predictions and then see what happens like as the year progresses oh that's cool i mean his his books are great you know i think he started the mixing secrets like that kind of book series i think yeah i don't remember exactly the title but i have one of them yeah yeah so he's you know kind of kind of guys that that talk to you know the the veterans of the industry and see what's going on and like you know how they've 
um, worked in the business because the business has changed a lot. That's why, you know, plugging companies like Baby Audio and Keeve and co- companies like that, you know, Jesse Ray starting his own co- company is like, uh, uh, our business is dramatically different than anyone who ever started in the 80s or the 90s or even early 2000s. Like, it is a completely different game. You know, I'm reading, you know, yeah. like I said, I'm reading this Al Schmidt book and he's talking about a, a console with only six inputs, you know, and one microphone. So instead of like putting a mic on everyone, you have to move people around to get more of of this instrument in, in the microphone, you know? It's, it's, it really was a different time. I mean, even learning from Bruce, it's like, he was doing things that were um, he didn't like plugins, you know, because <laughs> because yeah. that that wasn't his time. But he told us he's like, hey, if I were you, I'll use everything, use all the plugins. But guys like that, you know, guys like Schmidt and, and Eddie Sherney and, and Bruce and guys like that, it's like they came from a time where they had to engineer out of like necessity as far as like they had to make things up, like Eddie Kramer, like making up a flange, like using multiple tape machines. Like these guys really engineered the shit out of records, you know? Um, there were expert recording engineers, expert mixers. I mean, that's the other thing I learned from Bruce. Like, he was such a careful, like, a master of, like, recording instruments. Like, we're going to use this ribbon microphone and we're going to place it like this. And everything was, like, perfect. So when you, like, put the faders up, the song sounded done. I think right nowadays, I think, you know, some people are so quick to mix that they forget that they're recording. Like, they just want to just record it. They don't even care if the tube tech is slammed or if they're just like destroying the vocal. Like they just want to get straight to the yeah. mix. I'm yeah. like, yeah, that's just one instrument. Most, most people are just recording vocals and drums and maybe some piano, bass, guitar. The the amount of like recording nowadays is like I feel like it's a lot less. And it's very directional too, right? You know, it won't be like yeah, a whole band. Went- like one guy. Yeah, every, everybody's using cardioid mics, right? Like, yeah, it's yeah, a, yeah. It's a different world, and yeah, it's uh, yeah, for better or worse, it's it's where we're at right now, you know. And it's like uh, that's why we're using plugins like Soothe, and uh, I forgot Baby Audio's version of that was called, but like, you know, we're 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 just getting to the getting to the creative bit, which is which is cool because you know like. You know, the performance is more important than the the sound at the end of the day, like the, you it's, know, like how the vocalist sings. That's that's more important. And if they're inspired, like, just let's go. You know, people are doing using iPhones, you know, <laughs> the new Mac, I, you know, MacBook Pros have amazing microphones even like just just get it in there, you know. Yeah. Sometimes. Just, and that's 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 what ends up happening. But and so we mixers have to be more creative and kind of problem solve in a whole new way. Because, you know, we don't have routing issues as, as much as we just need to kind of, you know, do use creative tools to kind of get things to de-harshify or, you know, work better or whatever it is, you know? Yeah, just work, work with the song in mind, you know, just like, there's things that I'm like, okay, you know, I, I like I have a template, but the template doesn't really do anything. It's just routing. So I'm like, okay, every song is different because if I try to have a one size fits all approach. It's not, every song is not going to fit into the box the same way. It's like, you know, certain things are go-tos for a reason. They work more so than not, you know, universally speaking. And it's like, um, but then it's just cool to just come up with things on the fly, like start a new stereo bus while you're mixing, like, or just, you know, come up with a new vocal sound. Cause I'm, I'm looking at things like, Okay, like things are like done now. Like, how do I improve upon this? Like, what do I what do I need to do? And like, we have so many good tools, and it's like, well, how do you get out of the music's way? Like, how do you just make it breathe and make it just do what it has to do? You know, without like mm-hmm. overthinking it or forcing to use a plugin because you have it. You know. <laughs> yeah. Like. Yeah, I mean, like when you when when you, when you hear a mix that's like a, a rough mix that sounds so good. And you're not necessarily even hearing real problems. Like, how do you, what's the first thing you're, what are you listening for to kind of get something that's more, I guess, maybe emotionally turn, tuned into the to the record to kind of enhance it? Uh, that's a good maybe question. Maybe that's a hard question to answer. It's a hard um, question to answer, probably. I just kind of close my eyes and listen to it. I kind of just walk around and listen to it, kind of make these mental notes. The rough mix, the, what, I, what I find more than not, the rough mix has the energy that people want. Like, it has... The emotional cues 
they're like, okay, the cues are there, but like some 